But the first thing to say about self is that it's not like this. There is this naive view, which I, I, I'm sure we don't, probably nobody has anymore anyway, but this is the view that the self is this little homunculus sitting inside your skull that is receiving all this information, that there's a world out there, we detect it, and it's the self is doing the detection of, sensor, of, of sensory data to form perceptions of that world. And the self, in this view, is the thing that does the perceiving. The other way to think about this cycle, and I think the more correct way, is that the self itself is a perception. It's not that the self is, does the perceiving. There's a process. There are processes of perception going on in the brain, and some of those lead to experiences of the world, and others lead to experiences of the self. But it's the same basic process that underlies them both. It's this process of perceptual predictions being constrained in various ways by sensory prediction errors. And when it comes to the self, there are actually a number of different ways in which we experience the self. There's not just a single uh, experience of selfhood. There's experience of the object in the world that is our body, the experience of the bodily or embodied self. There's the experience of having a first-person perspective on the world, the perspectival self. There's experiences of free will and of agency, of volition. And then finally, there's the experience of being a continuous individual over time with a set of memories and plans for the future. And the experience of social self is the, the degree to which we experience ourselves refracted, if you like, through the minds of, of, of others, uh, which a big part of what it is to be a human self, at least. And the idea is that all of these aspects of self are perceptions of particular kinds. And... Um, I just want to mention one of these aspects, which is the bodily self. This is the experience of the object in the world that is our body. And what we experience as being our body is a perceptual best guess where sensory data are reined in. Uh, sensory data serve to control predictions about um, what object in the world is our body. There's a very famous illustration of this called the rubber hand illusion, which um, you may well have seen before where somebody, somebody's real hand, the guy in blue, his real hand is hidden from view behind that partition and a fake hand is put in front of them. And then both hands are stroked simultaneously with a paintbrush while the person is focusing their attention on the fake hand. <laughs> and the, the idea there is that because this person is seeing touch and feeling touch on a fake hand, that's enough evidence so that the brain makes its best guess that the fake hand is in fact part of the body. Now, that's been the story for many years, but actually recently in the lab, we think that may not be true, um, may not be actually what's going on. So we've just, in the last couple of years, done a quite a, an interesting experiment, I think. This was led by Peter Lush did the world's largest rubber hand experiment where we did the rubber hand illusion on about 400 people um, at Sussex. And what we are interested in was the degree to which they experienced this illusion as a function of how hypnotically suggestible they are. Uh, hypnosis is not just stage, stage trickery. It's not just Darren Brown. Um, it's a very reliable individual trait that measures the ability for people to generate experience according to suggestion and the, the rubber hand illusion setup is a very strong implicit suggestion that you should have a particular kind of experience you know you see this fake hand people ask you whether you experience it or not it's being stroked and so on and we actually found a very strong correlation uh, between how hypnotizable you are and the degree to which you experience this uh, this illusion so this is this is I think kind of interesting because it could apply to very, very many um, experiments about uh, perceptual experience, especially experiences of what that are related to the body, because there's there's that those seem to be particularly malleable, particularly changeable, and they seem to depend strongly on individual suggestibility. Uh, which is you can think of that as a, a sort of top down factor that. That, um, that means that the more suggestible you are, the more strongly your top-down predictions will constrain um, sensory data and will shape what you experience. 
So this applies to the rubber hand illusion. It may also apply, and this we haven't tested, but this is just another context where simple manipulations can generate very unusual experiences. So this is called the body swap illusion. And what you do here is you take, this is as doing it in an informal setting, you take two virtual reality headsets, they have cameras attached, and you take two people, they each wear one of these setups, um, but you swap the camera feed. So now that each person sees themselves from the perspective of the other. And if you then have some, uh, some intervention such as they shake hands with each other, so they get some sort of multi-sensory stimulation, a lot of people report the strange experience of somehow now feeling that they have left their body and are seeing themselves from another body's perspective. Uh, this is often called a kind of autoscopic illusion. They're seeing themselves from a different perspective. Again, this is very likely influenced by how suggestible they are, but for people who are suggestible, the effect can be quite, quite strong. And this is, it's a fascinating thing to be part of. I've, I've, I've tried it out a couple of times in different situations and it's quite, I found it quite powerful. And I think it goes to show as well that, um, that things that people can have interesting and highly suggestive experiences for quite simple reasons. And of course, an experiment like this relates to things like out-of-body experiences. People have long talked about out-of-body experiences um, reported in cultures for thousands of years. And the existence of out-of-body experiences does not mean that the, the self or the soul or whatever is, is sort of separable from the physical body and can go floating around. What I think reports of out-of-body experiences underline is that the experience of where you are in space is another aspect of perception. And it's just another best guess that the brain reaches on the basis of ambiguous uh, sensory data. And sometimes it reaches the conclusion that you're not in the body. That's fine. You have that experience. It doesn't mean that there's an immaterial soul that's left the body. Saying that there's not any experiences of having a body, this object in space, but I think at the root of selfhood is the experience of being a body, of simply being a kind of living organism.